Well, thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I am just uh, delighted. I feel like this is, uh, in a real sense, a sacred day. Uh, and it's just a real pleasure to be a part of it. Um, I first heard Ken Pargament speak when I was at Vanderbilt University some 15 years ago nearly. Um, and then I went to the University of Pennsylvania where I was invited by Marty Seligman to help develop and then um, direct and teach in the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program there. And I remember uh, a few years into the program, I was talking with one of my colleagues about a course that I was teaching, a service learning course where I wanted to um, have the students learn about work that is being done by researchers and practitioners in a variety of fields. And I said to this colleague, I said, you know, what I'd really love to have is Ken Pargament to come and be a, a guest lecturer in the class. And my colleague said, well, why don't you ask him and see if he can come? I said, no, I can't ask, can't ask Ken Pargament to come to, you know. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 you got to just, just ask him. So I asked him, um, and uh, for the last, I don't know, five, six years now, we've been really graced with Ken's presence, um, talking with students in our Applied Positive Psychology program about spirituality and religion and sanctification, and threading the needle so deftly uh, talking about things that any of the rest of us, I think, could get into a lot of trouble about. Um, Ken is able to do it in a way that's very stimulating, very real, uh, and also um, very effective. So um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of this um, very special day. Uh, so speaking of the special, I would next like to tell you about my son. My son's name is Liam. Uh, that's short for William James. Um, and uh, Liam loves uh, art. He is five years old. Uh, uh, about a year ago, we were in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum, and we found a statue, and here is an eagle. Liam loves animals, and so he was delighted that we found a statue that had an animal in it. Liam loves literature. Uh, not too long ago, I read him Stuart Little. Any of you read Stuart Little? Yeah, fabulous story about a boy who grows up to be a mouse, so great story. Um, Liam also loves movies. Uh, he loves Curious George, uh, Inside Out, uh, lot, lots of movies. Um, Liam also loves music, and um, he likes to sing. It's, oh, it's just a, such a delight to hear him singing as he's in the bathroom getting ready or whatever he's doing, playing, and he's singing along. Um, and of course, these uh, modalities in the arts and the humanities are a key part of his socialization. Is there anyone here who likes uh, art, literature, movies, and music? Let me see your hands. <laughs> All right, very good. So what I'd like to invite you to do is to think about one particular cultural artifact, a particular work of art, uh, a particular work of literature, a poem, novel, or a particular movie, or a particular piece of music or song that has been important in your life for your own well-being. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to share something with your neighbor about this. So think about one particular song, movie. Who's got one in mind? Let me see your hands. Okay, we'll give you another 20 seconds to think. It doesn't have to be the perfect one, just something that has been important for your well-being in your life. Okay? Now I'd like you to turn to a neighbor and um, share what that is and just talk for a minute or two about what, the, what significance, what well-being significance that has had for you in your life? Go for it.
Okay, very good. Let's come back together and excellent, 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 great. Good. So um, my question for you is you've each shared with each other um, some cultural artifact that is important for your well-being. Think about that cultural artifact and I'd like you to consider whether or not you have experienced some sense of transcendence or ultimate value or purpose uh, or boundlessness, some kind of sacred quality to that uh, experience. If you did, uh, if, if you have, could you raise your hand with that connection? Look around the room. Look around the room. This is phenomenal. And this is one reason why I'm delighted to be here, um, because I've been doing some work in the humanities and human flourishing. Uh, and this gives us a chance, I think, to think not only about the general connection between the humanities and well-being, but also what role the sacred uh, and sanctification might play in that study. So first of all, I'd like to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing, and then ask some of those questions that this day, in particular, calls to the fore. So in the humanities and human flourishing, I like to talk ab about a eudaimonic turn. Uh, Julie, I share some of your concerns about, um, uh, uh, how did you put it, a uh, relentless uh, and uniform positivity. And so I prefer the notion, the eudaimonic turn, uh, which I understand as an explicit acknowledgement of the central importance of well-being and considered in its full range, considered in its balanced sense, both of trying to help us promote the things that uh, we want and are good for us and also mitigating against the things that uh, aren't uh, so healthy. And there is a eudaimonic turn going on in psychology, in psychiatry, economics, education, business, health, neuroscience. There's a, it's kind of in the air these days. It seems to be part of the zeitgeist. The situation in the humanities, I think, is a little bit uh, lagging. In fact, it feels to me that the humanities, in some respects, are recapitulating the experience of psychology of 20 years ago. When Marty Seligman and other founders of the field of positive psychology looked around and said, you know, psychology is really focusing on what's going wrong in life and how to fix it, which is important. But how about looking on the other side to what goes well and how to cultivate it? And so it seems to me that there are a few people in the humanities who are beginning to challenge what has become a hegemonic sense of uh, the role of suspicion in the arts and the humanities. Uh, what's, what, is, um, what, what do we need to look at here that is going wrong or what ideologies have snuck into literature and art uh, that we need to problematize and, and call out and so forth. And there are a few people who are saying, yes, we need to be suspicious um, about, uh, you know, art and literature have been used for propaganda purposes, for example. So we do need to be suspicious, but if that's all we are, we certainly are leaving a lot on the table. So I believe that because the humanities are still largely governed by this perspective of um, suspicion and uh, uh, focusing on what can go wrong, that's hindering the eudaimonic turn across all disciplines. Why is that? Well, three specific reasons. First of all, the humanities and the arts, and by the way, when I say the humanities, I mean broadly including the arts as well. They're a repository of information, perspectives, and approaches for understanding and cultivating well-being. Human beings have been interested in these questions for millennia and around the world. And so the arts and the humanities are a rich treasury, a rich repository of this information. Second, the arts and the humanities are a crucial collaborative partner for the science of well-being. Uh, I'm a philosopher. I've been embedded among psychologists for the last 10 years, uh, and I've been delighted to see the work, the empirical approaches, for example, that positive psychologists and other social scientists are taking to age-old questions uh, of the good life. I've also been concerned, though, that it seems to me that there aren't enough um, humanity scholars involved in this process. So I think about, for example, some of the constructs in positive psychology, the values in action, classification of strengths uh, and virtues, where Christopher Peterson and Marty Seligman, the ones who spearhead, spearheaded this process, did a literature, actually they didn't do a literature review, they did a culture review. 
they looked to cultures across time and across place to see what values uh, were salient for each of those cultures. And so culture, the arts, and the humanities were extremely important there. The humanities are also important for conceptual clarification. As a philosopher, it has been astonishing to me to realize that positive psychology is almost 20 years old, and to date, no one had done a careful, robust analysis, conceptual analysis, of the field's most basic term, the positive. What do we mean by the positive? And so uh, I felt compelled to oblige, um, and I wrote a very long paper. It was like 75 pages. Um, but it was published in two parts in the Journal of Positive Psychology uh, just a month or two ago. So it's important, I think, for uh, humanities scholars to be involved in this work um, to be able to uh, help out with conceptual clarification. Now, if it had been only up to us philosophers to do positive psychology, we wouldn't have gone beyond the, uh, uh, the conceptual clarification and the definition stage. So collaboration is really important. Finally, the humanities are essential for cultivating human flourishing. If we think about the role of the humanities in our lives, music and literature and art and movies, these are primary vehicles for cultivating well-being uh, in the lives of five-year-olds and in the lives of people of the sort who are in this room today. So why are the humanities under-involved in the eudaimonic term? So I think there are uh, particular reasons. I'll identify four different biases. First of all, there's an economic bias, um, perhaps best represented by um, one of the presidential candidates who's no longer in the field, who said, and I quote, uh, welders make more than philosophers. We need more welders and less philosophers. Uh, yeah, that, that felt, that really hurt. Um, it hurt grammatically. Uh, <laughs> there are a couple of assumptions there in that bias. First of all, there's a normative claim that value is financial. Value is financial. Philosophers, welders, the value that they, that they bring is reduced to their economic impact. And then secondly, the factual claim is that the financial value of the humanities is weak. Turns out that's also problematic. But that's kind of the economic bias. If you major in literature, uh, you, you're not going to be able to succeed uh, in the ways that really count. So you're going to be on the losing side in the first sense uh, that, that Annette was talking with us uh, earlier. So economic bias, what's really important is what is uh, financial. Then secondly, there's an extrinsic use bias. And in this view, um, the arts and the humanities do have value. They do have economic value. In fact, if you have a few million extra dollars, I might suggest you, invent, uh, you invest in painting. It can have a, a large economic impact. Uh, there's a professional impact, of course, for people in the university, for example. If you know enough about history, you can get tenure, and you can have a great professional career uh, knowing about the arts and the humanities. Of course, entertainment uh, um, and also academics. So you need to take a philosophy course in order to fulfill your breadth uh, requirement to get your degree, right? And so what happens is the arts and the humanities are used for these other purposes, for professional advancement, for economic gain, for academic achievement. And oftentimes what's lost is the eudaimonic or the well-being perspective. Third, even of those uh, folks who do recognize that there's a eudaimonic uh, perspective here, oftentimes what is most salient is what I mentioned earlier, this hermeneutics of suspicion. So if you look to what the arts and the humanities have to say about well-being, they're chiefly a bunch of red flags about things that have been incorporated that, uh, that into our culture that should not be there. And then um, there are those who say, well, the arts and the humanities are simply ineffable. They're, they're meaningful, they're important for human life, but there's no way you could possibly measure them, right? So I think these are four large reasons why we don't have more progress in the arts and the humanities about understanding their well-being value. And I think the problem with these, uh, these biases is not what they emphasize, but what they overemphasize. So for example, the economic bias, of course, the financial value of things is important, but so is the eudaimonic value. With respect to the extrinsic use bias, of course, the economic, the uh, professional, entertainment, and academic uses of things are important. Uh, but so are the uh, eudaimonic uses. And the negativity bias. Of course, suspicion is important. As I mentioned, 
the arts and the humanities have been used in many different uh, situations and contexts for propaganda purposes, to, uh, to uh, manipulate and so on. So we do need to be suspicious. And uh, that's problematic if that's all we have, because we also need, so Paul Ricoeur is the one who coined this term, the hermeneutics of suspicion. He also coined the term, the hermeneutics of affirmation. And I submit that a balanced perspective of the arts and the humanities has to include both of them. And then with the immensurability bias, yeah, I agree. I don't know what it would mean to measure the arts and the humanities. But I do know that the arts and the humanities have effects. And sometimes they have very, very powerful effects. And surely those effects can be measured. And we can do better and better about devising ways of doing so. So we're uh, working on a project um, to try to um, carry this work forward. When I first met Marty Seligman about a little over 15 years ago, uh, I looked more like a philosopher. Uh, I had long hair uh, in a ponytail. Um, and uh, I stood up and asked a question in the meeting. It was the first public meeting on positive psychology. And Marty Seligman had just given his state of the field address. Um, and I was the first one to ask a question. And so I stood up and said, uh, look, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a philosopher. And Christopher Peterson was in the audience, and he later told me that when he heard me say that, uh, he turned to um, one of the, to his neighbor and said, oh, my goodness, except a little more colorfully stated than that. <laughs> um, the last thing we need is some self-righteous philosopher who's going to tell us exactly how we've gotten everything wrong and how we should be doing things. But I said, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a philosopher. And the next thing I said was, and I really love what you're doing, and I, I, I want to be a part of it. Um, so I've been, it occurred to me that what Marty Seligman and his colleagues were doing was positive psychology. They were also interested in the positive social sciences. And what I was interested in was the positive humanities and the positive liberal arts. And so uh, I've been very fortunate to have in the last couple of years a grant from the Templeton Religion Trust uh, to support this work, a planning grant, to begin to think out the ideas behind this, to begin to develop a network, and to uh, develop a proposal for a three-year multi-million dollar grant. And so in that process, we have created a, um, uh, a strategic plan for how to move forward uh, it with this work. So the Humanities and Human Flourishing, a multidisciplinary collaboration for understanding, assessing, and cultivating well-being. So what we will emphasize is that the humanities do have great value in our society. Much of this value is intrinsic to their content. Accessing this value requires affirmative approaches, a balanced approach, not just the suspicious approaches. And this value can be empirically measured and strategically advanced. So the way we are envisioning moving forward in this, and I feel like I'm kind of um, 15 years younger than uh, the projects that have been reported on today because there's a lot of empirical research already to be reported on. And we're just kind of at the beginning phases uh, of this, but it's an exciting uh, time. So what we're envisioning is bringing together scholars in seven different disciplines, philosophy, literature, religion and religious studies, history, art, music, and theater, and bringing together groups who will ask themselves the question, what is the value of this discipline for human life? And then to create a volume around that, uh, that question uh, and have it published as part of a book series. And Oxford University Press has, has indicated great interest in establishing a book series on the humanities and human flourishing uh, to get this information out. So we envision 10 scholars on seven different teams, so 70 folks working on this uh, question from a theoretical and humanities perspective. And from an empirical perspective, we envision qualitative studies as well as a whole host of quantitative studies. We want to look at uh, large-scale uh, uh, studies that have already been done. Can we mine data from there? Can we create our own studies ourselves? Can we collaborate with others who have particular uh, expertise and modes of inquiry that we don't? So for example, Gabby Starr, who is the dean at, uh, of, the, of, of humanities at NYU, is an English professor who's been doing a lot of work with fMRIs looking at aesthetic emotion. So we've talked with her about collaborating and trying to understand what's going on uh, at the level of the positive emotions 
um, that can sometimes come from engaging the humanities and the arts. And then, um, so this will involve dozens of scholars. Again, the idea here is to try to develop a network uh, to come at this from all different perspectives. So we can have self-reports, but we're not stuck just at the level of self-report. We can also come at it behaviorally and so forth. And then we envision uh, educational work as well. So working at the level of universities, at the level of high school teachers, at the level of informal educators in museums uh, and in um, theaters and so forth to uh, carry this forward. And then finally, dissemination. We'll have a website where we'll have information about this. Uh, we're mindful that the director of an art museum in Maine or the instructor of a humanities course at a community college in Arizona won't have access to the kinds of research that we are intending to do and publish in top journals, but they too need to know the well-being effects of what it is that they're doing. So one of the key deliverables that we are proposing is a toolkit of uh, instruments that we will be able to post on our website w for free access so that people can go there and uh, use that the, 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 the toolkit to try to understand more clearly what the well-being effects are of the work that they are doing, both for internal purposes to try to help to shape that work to be even more effective and for external purposes in terms of making the, the case to deans and uh, uh, policymakers and so forth. And then at the end of our uh, three years, we plan to have a conference where we'll bring everybody together and talk about our um, uh, uh, results and, and uh, future, future plans. This is a picture uh, that was taken last year. It's a, our planning meeting, planning retreat that was sponsored by the Templeton Religion Trust. It brought together uh, humanities scholars uh, and um, also social scientists, uh, as well as we had the director of education from the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and the assistant chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we're, again, trying to um, trying to bring together the humanities scholars with empirical researchers and also uh, we're partnering with and we're delighted to have the, uh, the interest and support uh, from places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, also Opera America, uh, Lincoln Center, uh, Kennedy Center, uh, and so on. So um, just very briefly, I want to tell you a couple of um, things that we're, that, we're, that we're doing. I'll tell you a couple of anecdotes and then show you um, uh, uh, beginning uh, conceptual model that we're trying to develop for, for measurement purposes. So I teach a course every spring on the humanities and human flourishing. Uh, and uh, we do literature, we do art, we do music. One of the things I ask my students to read is The Death of Ivan Illich. Uh, and you might wonder what that's doing in a course on the humanities and human flourishing because I don't believe in this kind of relentless positivity. Um, it's important to have a range uh, of perspectives on this. Um, a couple of years ago, one of my students who was a lawyer at one of the largest law firms in the United States, she, was a, she had made partners. So to, ha to have someone that successful and in law to have a female partner, I mean, this, is a, this was a, a very significant achievement. Uh, and she came to our program, and uh, after reading this text, she sent me an email. And the email was entitled, Ivan Illich made me do it. I thought, oh my goodness, what is <laughs> what's coming now? So with temerity, I clicked open the email. She had stepped down from her position. She knew this was something she needed to do. She didn't want to end up like Ivan Illich on a deathbed, realizing that she had lived her life missing the most meaningful things. She is now in a PhD program at Claremont Graduate University for positive organizational uh, psychology. And her intention now is to go back to law firms to help them understand better how to increase meaning and engagement. Um, I take my students to an art museum and I ask them to, among other things, look, look for a particular work of art that stands out for them that they can um, spend 20 or 30 minutes in front of with a question of what is the value of this work of art for their own well-being. Typically, we go to art museums and we go to the Blockbuster, take a selfie, post it on Facebook, run to the next one. Not so sure that that is conducive uh, uh, to well-being, but we can discuss that at another time. <laughs> so one of my students found this work of art by toulouse lautrec um, and she started observing it, and she thought, this woman looks sad. Why was I attracted to this work of art? I'm not sad. Actually, I am sad. Why am I sad? I'm sad because of my work. Dr. Julie Hayslip is an intensive care pediatric 
uh, 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 physician at the University of Virginia Medical Center. But she wasn't feeling engaged. She wasn't being able to bring her best self to work. So she continued to look at this painting. She thought, this woman is also determined. Furthermore, there's a window behind her. If she took action, she could change her circumstances and change her life. I'm determined. What action can I take to change my circumstances and to change my life? And she thought, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on at the nursing school at UVA that's a lot more aligned with what I want to do. So she developed a plan. When she left, she indeed got in contact with the nursing school and is doing work there that is much more aligned, and she now feels reengaged with her work. So these are a couple of examples of how the arts and the humanities can be a kind uh, uh, of um, intervention. So uh, our colleagues and I have begun some of this work in, the, uh, in literature in particular, the eudaimonic turn, uh, well-being and literary studies, and then most uh, uh, recently on human flourishing, a poetry anthology, which is a collection of poems that addresses, again, a full range of questions of, uh, of flourishing, certainly positive emotions, but also times of struggle and difficulty. So um, now I'll take about an hour to go in detail through this conceptual model. Um, no, I'll just uh, tease you with it. Um, but this is our initial attempts to try to create a conceptual model where you can imagine, first of all, the challenge of defining the arts and the humanities. And so we can certainly define them from a rubric standpoint while there are uh, certain disciplines or certain courses that you might take. Um, but then there's also the question of um, the function uh, of the arts and the humanities. So it's not just reading literature, it's how you read it. right? And are you reading it or are you writing it? Uh, or are you um, uh, uh, critiquing it in some way, and so forth. And then we've got some uh, uh, mechanisms, absorption, embeddedness, socialization, and reflectiveness. Again, I won't go into detail because of time. And then what kinds of levels of human flourishing each of these might, uh, might, might um, uh, develop or, or might lead to. So finally, the question then becomes what we began with in terms of our own experiences of the arts and the humanities can be so very powerful. And so my question, and it's really a question, is what then is the role of spirituality and the sacred and sanctification along these lines? Would sanctification be one of the topics that the humanities and the arts would study? I mean, sur surely under religion we could say that, that it falls there. Would it be one of the mechanisms? Would it be that if you experience more a sense of the sacred, that's a way that drives uh, the outcomes? Would it be human flourishing outcomes themselves? Would, uh, would, would sanctification or sacredness be something that we would want to aim for? All of the above, I don't know. Uh, but again, coming here an, uh, has, has um, enabled me to, to begin thinking about these questions. Um, and uh, I would, value greatly uh, company uh, in thinking about um, those questions. But again, it seems to me to be very, very important and that we're kind of in this moving in a new direction, not only the work that uh, Ken has led so many of us in, in terms of thinking about uh, the religious experience from a phenomenological standpoint and from a way that we can measure some of those outcomes, now thinking about the arts and the humanities from a similar perspective and then thinking about integrating those uh, and asking questions about how our experience of the arts and the humanities may already contain the sacred, or can we um, encourage in certain contexts uh, the, the move towards the sacred, and could that make that experience even more salient? So thank you very much.